Thank you, Stacy, for being the rock star that you are. And it is great to be with all of these wonderful people behind me. You know, as I go across the country, I'm campaigning for a lot of House members and senators, and everybody across the country asks me about Pennsylvania. And the question they ask is, they're not really going to elect John Fetterman, are they? And you know why they're asking that? Is because they've seen what he said. They've seen the fact that he wants to release a third of inmates. They've seen the fact that he says he wants to decriminalize drugs, including heroin and fentanyl. They see that he wants to take away law enforcement's ability to defend themselves. So you can see why the country's saying, but they're really not going to vote for him, are they? But the hard part is, we've really got to make sure everybody understands what's at stake here. You know, I talk about what we're hearing in the elections, and obviously you can see with the press, all eyes are on Pennsylvania because this is the seat to the majority in the Senate. But now let me talk to you as a governor. So I was a governor, and one of the things you always try and do is understand inmates, what gets them into jail, when do they get out of jail, and what keeps them from going back. And the most disappointing thing I saw was the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections came out and said that two-thirds of the inmates that got out got right back in. Now, something's wrong with that. And the thing that's wrong with that is, first of all, there's no fear. If there's no fear of law and order, they will go back and recommit. If there's no fear of accountability and punishment, people will continue to let them go. The answer is always transparency, accountability, law and order, having the backs of your law enforcement, and then rehabilitation. Through things we put in place in South Carolina, South Carolina now has the number one, um, ranks number one in the highest rate of recidivism. We don't have our inmates come back. We get them jobs. We put them out on the streets. You've got to make sure that you do everything you can. We have the lowest rate of recidivism. I just realized I said the highest rate. We have the lowest rate of recidivism in the country now. And that's what I want for Pennsylvania. That's what I want for every other state. But now let me tell you that I'm going to talk to you as a mom. As a mom, my son goes to school here in Pennsylvania. As a mom, I never thought that I would have to say an extra prayer for his safety. As a mom, I'm constantly telling him when he leaves campus, be careful and watch your back. I feel for the moms in Pennsylvania. I feel for the parents in Pennsylvania. You shouldn't have to worry whether your child rides their bike down the street. You shouldn't have to worry if you're going to get carjacked going to a restaurant. But that's what's happening in Pennsylvania. And you have a chance to make this better. We've got a right or wrong. And I'll tell you what we need is sanity again in Pennsylvania and across this country. We need strength again in Pennsylvania and across this country. And it starts in November. It starts with the elections and it starts with Pennsylvania. So you have a great opportunity to bring back safety, to bring back law and order, to reduce drugs, to reduce crime, but more importantly, to do the number one job government's always supposed to do, which is protect the citizens. And I am very proud and excited for the people of Pennsylvania, because that will start the day you elect the next senator of Pennsylvania, Dr. Oz. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, I want to start off by saying that I have developed close relationships with everyone you see behind me today. And I thank each and every one of you for taking time, because I know you're all busy, and making sure that you are here to speak about something that's dear to me, which is making sure that folks are safe. Now, most of my life I was doing that by talking about health issues. But it turns out that not being safe creates a lot of health issues as well. I was with a group of pastors at a prayer vigil in Philadelphia dealing with some of the recent murders that have afflicted young children. I mean, half the 48% of the homicides are involving people under the age of 18. So not only by definition are they illegally owning guns to which, with which they do the homicides, but they're also children. And you wonder how did this even happen? And much of it is because 
as you've heard echoed a bit, it creates a, a post-traumatic stress disorder environment when you're surrounded by violence that fractures communities. The levels of the post-traumatic stress disorder are similar to what we see in war veterans and in refugee camps. But when society is fractured and there's violence, it breaks even further, but there's nothing to heal the community because everything's broken apart, which is one of the reasons we have a transformative moment in Pennsylvania history. We have to stop now the increasing homicide and violence rates, not just in Philadelphia, but across the Commonwealth. I was at the Steelers game last week at a tailgate, less than three blocks away, a few hours earlier, three men were murdered, two of them innocent bystanders. In Philadelphia, almost every day I wake up and open the paper and wonder how many people do we lose? Not did we lose anybody, but how many did we lose? Now last night's debate focused on my desire to bring balance to Washington, a desire to bring together left and right, on issues that are bipartisan in their very nature and allow us to solve problems that I'm asked about every single day on the campaign trail. No one ever asks me how I'm going to beat up the other side. That's not a question that comes up. What does come up is stop bickering and deal with the crises, which is basically letting these people behind me do their jobs, which we've somehow lost our path for. So when the you know, Pennsylvania State Troopers, and they're, God bless them for hosting us here, and the Fraternal Order of Police, and law enforcement leaders all here are supporting me, it's because I've spoken to them and I understand their issues. The most important thing as a doctor we do is to listen. And I've heard them say over and over again, they don't feel supported. They don't feel funded. You know, we're losing people in Philadelphia, I'll give numbers, 45% increase in early retirement, a dramatic increase in folks just leave the force and they can't recruit any young people. I was in Erie, and there was a big, we were doing a big town hall, and a roughly 50-year-old woman uh, was very emotional, and she put her hand up, I called on her, and she said, I'm very upset about my son. He's in law enforcement. And I said, what happened? And she said, well, I'm not worried about his safety. I, I could be, but I already knew that was part of the equation when he wanted to be an officer. But what I didn't realize is that people would not respect him for risking his life. That just sucked her soul out. And I hear that from the brave souls behind me, but I hear it on the streets when I'm walking and talking to the police wherever I go. A sense that there's no point doing this if what I'm doing isn't helping society. Why would I risk it? If I'm going to apprehend someone doing something wrong and they're released hours later, if no one's going to actually prosecute a crime that clearly happened, what's the point? If I'm blamed anytime there's an altercation that doesn't go smoothly, why would I risk it? It's a recurrent theme over and over again. Last night I pushed on a couple topics. Let me just touch on the two critical ones for this gathering. The first is the border and fentanyl. Pennsylvania is number three in the country now in fentanyl deaths. There's not a single event I go to where I ask for a show of hands and don't see one or two people say that their families have been personally affected by fentanyl. There was a woman just recently, at, uh, I was in Philadelphia doing an event on Saturday, who said that her daughter had Lyme, chronic Lyme disease, and had ordered an over-the-counter, or I should say street version of a pain medication. And it was delivered to the mailbox. Social media was the mechanism by which she ordered it. The child took this. She was in her 20s. Uh, her mother found her blue and dead several hours later. It had been laced with fentanyl. An African-American preacher in the city of Philadelphia told me that it's easier for his parishioners to find fentanyl than baby formula. I asked around. Everyone agreed with him. Now, yes, they cut the fentanyl with baby formula, but also there's just no baby formula there. We've created an impoverished region where it's much easier to go down to the corner, from this church, by the way, and find fentanyl affordable, easy, and simply acquired because we are funding the salesmen, the cartels, who are running human trafficking operations across a porous border, which we're allowing, and by allowing their profits to be reinvested from human trafficking to buying fentanyl from China, we're now actively embracing a supplier of a toxic substance. We confiscated enough fentanyl last month to kill every, every person in America. And the state troopers just told me they confiscated last quarter seven times more fentanyl than they did in 2020. Seven times increase. All of it because we're aiding and abetting inadvertently cartels, which are really terrorist organizations bringing narcotics here. Now, all while this is happening, my opponent, John Fetterman, has argued that we should decriminalize all drugs, and create heroin injection sites. I went to a heroin injection site in Philadelphia, did an event there to point out that no one wants it in their backyard because it brings crime. And giving people the ability to take heroin long term is not a survival strategy. You're not going to do well taking heroin long term. So these ideas don't make sense, in my opinion. But let's move from my opinion to proof. 
When Oregon passed Measure 110 two years ago, John Fetterman tweeted out strong support for it. Let's look at what happened. In Oregon, there was a 40% increase over the last year and a half in deaths from drug overdose, mostly fentanyl, 40%. Now, you think that's bad, but let me just <laughs> stun you with something more important. 50% increase in homicide rates. I'll say it again. You legalize drugs, all drugs, including narcotics, you have a 50% increase in homicide rates, at least in Oregon. Now, why is that? Because you don't let police do their work. They can't confiscate the drug. They can't arrest people for having narcotics. And so those people tend to do other bad things. Or they start fighting with each other on the turf wars, and you end up with increased homicides with innocent civilians caught in the middle. We can do better. Second big theme today, besides the drug overdose problems that we're allowing and with the associated crime, is the actual crime itself. And I have been harsh on this topic because I'm speaking for many who can't speak for themselves. Many folks inside certainly the big cities tell me they feel like they're part of a social experiment where people, and this is their words, white woke people make rules and they're stuck with the problem. And if you look at it objectively, it doesn't seem too far from the truth. Again, it's, it's not done on purpose, but the result is unsafe communities because we're doing an experiment and we're not willing to look harshly at that data, at what's really happening. If you take policies that don't work and you don't course correct them, everyone suffers. As a doctor, if I prescribe you a pill for a problem and it doesn't get better, I need to change what I'm doing. I can't blame you. And that's why I'm calling for a more thoughtful approach to law enforcement. Now, John Fetterman, when he says he wants to release one third of all prisoners and wouldn't make anyone less safe, that's an experiment. That hasn't been tried before. I'd rather not do it all at once, and certainly right now is not a good time with the middle of the crime spree we're in the violence rates through the roof and carjacking. We just had our thousandth carjacking last month. A thousand carjackings because people get away with it. And they go on to do other bad crimes after they do get away with it. But even more concerning to me is this obsession with releasing murderers who have been convicted by a jury of peers, sentenced to life in prison, and John Fetterman thinks he knows better. Dozens of times he's voted to release these inmates Several dozen times, he was voting against the other parole board members. In almost all cases, he's voting against the desires of the family. Maureen Faulkner joined me last night at the debate at backstage and was sharing the story of Danny, her husband, a Philadelphia police officer who was brutally gunned down. She doesn't want the murderers released, yet people like Maureen are suffering continually every day and not being consulted about what these decisions are going to mean in their communities. And just this past week, you may have seen the headlines around it, the so-called Conviction Integrity Unit. When the Conviction Integrity Unit sounds like an Orwellian term. It was something that was created by Krasner, who's in a little bit of trouble right now, I'm seeing on television as I walked in here, uh, with articles of impeachment, I think, being uh, uh, dropped. But this, art, this Conviction Integrity Unit had freed a murder, his name I wrote down, Jameer Harris. Now, in 2012, Jameer Harris walked up to a man with his five-year-old son in the back seat, shot him in the head, and walked away. They caught him. He was convicted. He went to jail. This Conviction Integrity Unit goes back and reevaluates whether the prosecution did a good job. They decided they were going to drop the charges. The judge did not want to drop the charges. The family knows he killed their loved one. No one thought this guy was innocent, from what I can tell. I only know what you all are reading. Yet this man went free in March. And he was free until Saturday. Because in September, he murdered another man. Very similar approach. Walked up to him, cased him out, walked back. Two people came with him. They shot the man to death. And he was on the, the run. And he finally was apprehended. But interestingly, John Fetterman, all this time, has been advocating for the Crim Conviction Integrity Unit. I'm going to quote him because this week he did an interview, just this week, saying that it was a groundbreaking pro approach. It was a beacon for the future. It should be, quote, unquote, mandatory in all 67 counties. And because it's not, he decided to turn the parole board into the equivalent of the Conviction Integrity Unit, an approach that seems to give more credibility and seems to care more about the criminals than it does about the innocent, the people who are hurt in these endeavors. Now, when I read this in the different out, outlined documents that I'm given every single day, I look with the, and I'm incredulous that this is happening in a vacuum. I just don't get it. I don't understand why this continues over and over again. And I, every time I open up a new document, I see something new. I just read that he had voted to release a man who stabbed his girlfriend's mother to death with shears, scissors. 
and then wanted the man released because he had learned uh, yoga in prison and had done a horticultural degree. These are wonderful things, and I'm glad those were all done. It doesn't mean that you're rehabilitated from first degree murder, which sometimes involves deeper psychological issues that make you dangerous. So I vow here and now that as a US Senator, I'll do the right thing for our communities, amongst them. I'm gonna let police do their jobs. Just do your job. I want our prosecutors to do their jobs. I don't want to have public defenders complaining that there's no one against them in court and they're being forced to defend people they know are guilty and are dangerous to society and they shouldn't be let go. So if the public defender is doing their job, prosecutors must do their jobs and political leaders must do their jobs as well, which means you interrogate what you're saying, you look at the results of your programs. If you've created a Kensington event, the largest open air drug market in the country with lax laws on drugs, you better deal with it. If you created mayhem in the city of Philadelphia with the highest murder rate ever last year, ever. I went to school in West Philly. I could walk around, bike around. It was never a problem. Families will not leave their homes. They're buying video games so their kids can stay safe, which is not the healthiest thing for a child, but it's better than walking on a street where they may get shot. I think Philadelphia deserves better than Krasner, and Pennsylvania deserves better than Fetterman. God bless you all. Thank you.